Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Warm welcome. Thank you. Warm welcome here at the Howe Hebelam Ufa. Warm welcome also, of course, to Berlinale Talents. It's a pleasure to see you, or almost see you. Very nice. And uh, you know that we are in the year of language, and in the year of language, it's also about conversation. Uh, so I would like to invite you to also say quickly welcome to the neighbor sitting next to you. That's a habit here <laughs> in our house. <laughs> Who is sitting next to you? You can speak in your mother tongue, so <laughs> common tongues. Thank you. It's actually very nice to hear that. And uh, talking about conversation, talking about language, this is also what is very much uh, in the center and uh, important for today's talk and uh, conversation because, as you know, so the language of cinema is strong when it comes up to collecting voices, but also bringing voices uh, to the big screen and then into your minds. And uh, I have someone uh, whom I'd like to introduce you to who is really, really good in bringing people into conversation. Please welcome the moderator today, Dorothy Wenner. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you for this very kind introduction. Uh, I'm so much looking forward to be the moderator of this session and of course it's first my pleasure to invite our guests on stage. Sisi Mlai, Agnes Lisa Wegner. Can you sit here? And Lak Razana Rajo. Please, you sit over there. So the title is Speaking Out, Film as a Culture of Memory. And as we were chatting away in the back, we were thinking at least 20 people from this year's uh, official program in front of the camera, behind the camera, involved in making films that deal with the subject matter could be on stage. We had to take a decision, but I want to um, briefly mention the other two films that distinctively um, speak on the, on the topic we are talking about. Uh, Mati Diop's Dao Me and Ina Delso Casas' film from Mozambique, The Nights Still Smell from Gunpowder, film that is featuring in, um, in the forum section. We have decided for two films, one documentary, one feature film, Sisi and Agnes have made the documentary The Empty Grave, which is in Berlinale Special. And Luck has made uh, the film Disco Africa, a Malagashi story, a feature film. And we will talk, of course, in more details about what was your approach to film and memory, how do you think these two topics are combined in the way of your storytelling, but also in the realities, cinema realities of your countries. Before doing so, I thought it might be interesting, and we, we discussed with Florian beforehand when we were sitting up this panel, as if there is something in the air. So it's not by, we thought, it's not by pure, uh, pure coincidence that this year's Berlinale has four films from African countries that deal in very different ways with the legacy, with the history of the country, with remembrance. So my question to you, and I don't know who uh, will start, what, do, what is your impression? Uh, were you surprised to see so many films that have a similar angle into looking in the past? that uh, you might feel familiar with, or what is your take on this? Is there something in the air, yes or no? I don't know who's... <laughs> Hello, guys. Uh, I'm Luke uh, Razana-John from Madagascar. 
uh, for this this question is very interesting because uh, uh, for me uh, for, for searching of the the past and the memory was uh, still in the air uh, in 70s 80s and uh, continue actually in uh, Africa, people in the, the continent and uh, in Madagascar. I, uh, in Madagascar especially, uh, we don't have a lot of archives or a lot of uh, uh, museum or a memory museum. Uh, the only uh, uh, place was for national TV who was burned in the riots in 2009. So actually, uh, we don't have nothing in terms of uh, uh, memory, cassette, or uh, something. So when you interrogate all Malagas people, they have a lot of uh, uh, lack of his past, and uh, every day it's, uh, we are searching for some things. So uh, maybe it's the same in another country of Africa, but that is actually especially for Madagascar. Yeah. Mm. Maybe for some of you it's interesting to know that Luck is returning as a filmmaker. Uh, he is an alumni of Berlinale Talents, so just for the background. Sisi, what about you? What is your feeling? Is that a pure coincidence or is there something more to it? Um, I, I mean, I think especially over the last couple of years, at least was a topic that we were dealing with uh, on the human remains and with uh, Dahomey, which is dealing with artifacts. Definitely, um, especially during the pandemic, I think there was that question of what's missing that became very loud and very clear. Um, and I'm not at all surprised that um, <laughs> over the last couple, excuse me, <clears throat> over the last couple of years we have had this rise. But um, the other interesting thing about it is that um, it is also where this history is being kept. Well, I mean, it, memory also interestingly doesn't have to be a question of something that is tangible and that you can touch. Um, in our film, at least, I thought that it was the question of space um, because these places become very sacred maybe to a specific community um, and maybe it's had significance for thousands of years, but because of the colonial history that has happened, the disconnection that has happened through modernization, uh, the lack of these histories becoming more folklore than being common discourse. Um, you find that you're stumbling on these spaces perchance when you go and speak to these communities. Um, and so in a way, it's sort of like a revival of sorts. Not that it's a discontinuation, but a continuation of something that's been happening since most of our country's independence on the continent. Do you want to add, or we take a look at the first clip from The Empty Grave? Yeah? Okay, so The Empty Grave, a documentary that was co directed by Sisi and Agnes, um, celebrated its world premiere yesterday. It's a collaboration, co production between Tanzania and Germany, and the two filmmakers accompany two families in search of their past and in search of the human remains, which Uh, are suspected to be in Germany or and in the US. We are seeing a clip, short clip, very much from the beginning uh, because the memory and the, the, the capacity of keeping this history alive for a long time in Tanzania, as far as I learned from your film and as far as I've been told, is very much kept in the families. So we are seeing a clip of how one family that is uh, one of the protagonist families, how they celebrate the memory of their um, ancestors. Can we see, please, the first clip?
So I, I think even if it's only like a short moment that we get to experience when seeing the clip from the beginning of this memorial day that you put at the very beginning of the film, my question to you, to Agnes and Cici, would be we already feel here what a politically and emotionally difficult subject it is. You knew this at the beginning. What made you, when you decided it's time for us to make this film, make this film together, Agnes and Cici, what drove you? What was your motivation to say, well, we feel for us it's the right time to take this decision and we embark on this journey making this film? From my perspective, the, the German perspective, German part of the directing duo, um, I, at the time, I didn't think of the importance of this film for the Tanzanian society, but for the Germans and Europeans to learn about this, learn about these families that are actually missing their ancestors that are being kept away here in our depots. And I think what my initial motivation was my shock when I heard about the fact that there are tens of thousands of human remains uh, locked away in boxes in our museums and universities and other institutions. And I think it was this desire to break the silence and I was very angry, very frustrated, and I thought people need to know about this. It's completely unacceptable that this hasn't only been done, these crimes weren't only committed, but that this thing, this crime, this pain is going on and it's, it hasn't ended. So that was the, yeah, that was, it was really the, that, that anger, frustration, and the pain. I was really hurt when I, when I heard about it for the first time. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, because of the heaviness of it all, <laughs> um, for both of us, it was like, well, then how do you get people to understand what this would feel like, because it's a historical issue, it's an institutional issue. Um, but from the moment we met our protagonists, it was clear it's a personal issue. Um, this is something that affects people, and it affects us. Um, and especially with the grave scene, that's what they're doing there is cleaning the grave of somebody who is no longer with them. Um, and it's not something that just this family does. It is something that's ubiquitous within most of our communities in Tanzania. It is a sign of saying, hey, this person belongs to us. Um, and for this family to be going there one generation to the next, because this is not something that's broken, it's continuous. It is keeping that alive, but going there and not having the fullness of it. That's something that we wanted to show how it's a communal grief that is holding these people together, something that they want to break, something that they want to end by putting that grief to an end by burying their loved one. Agnes, when you started, when you had this idea, you said you you were very clear from the beginning that you wanted to make this film with a Tanzanian filmmaker. However, you didn't know each other at the very beginning. So maybe a moment also to say hello and very warm welcome to Christoph Holthof, the German producer, and to Amil Chifji, the Tanzanian producer, who are with us here. Please give them a welcome. <laughs> So it was Amil, the matchmaker, who brought you two together. Uh, would you be able to
to give us like two, three crucial moments of something that I, I think it became very clear through your answer now that it was a very distinct decision. We want to make this film for X, Y, Z reason, but you didn't know what would happen throughout the process. If you could share with us some moments, maybe very challenging, difficult moments, what you hadn't expected, what you didn't know, what you learned, but maybe also some wonderful moments uh, of, of your experience while making this film. It took you three years, if I'm informed correctly, right? <laughs> Are you asking me? I Or don't know who of you. Oh, yeah, okay. Agnes said the other day, sometimes they don't know uh, because they, they spend so much time together <laughs> that they don't know who is the one to answer. It's up to you. Maybe let's, let's start with the difficult one, then yeah. we can move on to the... <laughs> um, so one of the um, uh, most uh, difficult days of filming um, that we had was actually the day that we ha were most prepared for, technically. Um, and as a documentary would have it, uh, that is not how the day um, ended, but... Um, There was, um, in one of the stories, um, the, this family lost their ancestor um, um, because he was hung, um, uh, and they executed 11 people on this day. And the execution happened about, I don't know, a uh, hundred kilometers away from where he lived and where his community was. And he was walked from that place to the far end of another community that he didn't know, didn't have the language, didn't understand, and he was kept there um, in incarceration for some time until the day of the execution. Um, and so one of the, our lead protagonists had never been to this place. Um, and he had told us that was his desire to go there um, and just see this space, the last place where his ancestor was alive. Um, and it, because everybody was enthusiastic about this and it was really his desire and want, we had a discussion, we had a good meeting with our DOP in the morning and we all set out and we were on, yes, <laughs> and we were on this journey um, in this bus. Um, and it was, it was very calm, you know, we, filmed him um, and his uh, niece, Sayuni, who had come, who he had brought with um, him uh, to visit this place. And um, we get there and we park the car and we get out and we go and we set up. We know what we're gonna do. This is gonna be the first shot. We're gonna move here, it's all good. And <clears throat> we place the camera on one side and our protagonist comes walking down to this tree. And he looks at it for uh, a long time and he just puts his head down. And you have to understand that this is a man who is very sturdy, he always warm, um, very sure, and in our culture, um, Crying in public is, especially for men, is just not something that happens. And when he lifted his head, he was, he was weeping. And at that moment, it's sort of like you realize that the past has come rushing through the bark of this tree from hundreds, from a hundred years back to the present day. And that day was incredibly, it was, it was an incredibly difficult day because uh, for the first time, um, the team knew exactly where they stood in the eyes of history because, um, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to, um, it, um, 
You know, we talk about generational trauma, and um, uh, it sounds very... Um, it's hard to articulate how potent it is, because I don't even think that he realized how much pain he'd been holding. Just to be at that site for him was enough to remind him how much pain there'd been that he's been holding on, not for him, but also for his community, because he's the head of his family. And um, he and I ended up having a discussion about it, and we both started weeping, and I'm not part of this community, I don't know it, but the connection there was about how this history had been stolen in a place that should have still remained being ours, a place of joy, a place where people could commune, and it was no longer that today. Not a hundred years ago, today, that pain was still there. But um, I think by the end of that day, because we, we had to, he asked us to leave, and um, that's what happened. Um, but we had a very um, interesting discussion over lunch, I think, as a team, um, because everybody was experiencing it from their, pers from their part of their history that they played there. And I'll never forget um, what Marcus looked like, our cameraman, because he was in complete shock. Um, uh, and you could tell that, um, you know, that moment really, I think it brought us together uh, as a team, at the end of it. Yeah, but I'm sorry that took so it was a long, winding road, but... Uh... Something beautiful and light <laughs> that we didn't expect. Um, there were very happy moments throughout the process of making this film. And I remember even our very early conversation, Cece, when you said it's so important to you that this is not just a very heavy film, but that we would also be able to talk about um, these families' resi resilience and their strength and their commitment and their hopes. And um, this was all on a more or less theoretical level because that was what we were hoping for, to find and let's also look for these. And um, there were, uh, I mean, it, of course, the whole experience, there was a lot of sadness and grief and very hard moments like this day that Cece just so accurately, perfectly described. Um, some of the let's say, positive things that I think um, I personally didn't expect uh, were, were some of the moments where I felt, or where I think all of us felt community, um, where we felt that we were forming a bond, uh, not only in our Tanzanian-German team, but also with all of the protagonists, that we were um, welcomed in families and that we were called family members. Um, that is something that, especially being a German woman, theoretically descendant of these um, perpetrators, uh, did not expect. And um, yeah, I don't have a concrete like anecdote that I can tell, but this is something that very often overwhelmed me in a very positive but also ambivalent way. Um, listening to you makes it very, very clear to me that if you speak about this relation between film, film story, how you make a film about, how you watch films, you need to be absolutely specific which area of the world you're talking about. I don't know if country is the right term, but in this case, maybe yes. Uh, and I would like to come back to the beginning of where we started, and have you, maybe Sisi, but maybe also our guests from Tanzania, explaining a little bit the role of cinema and film 
in Tanzania. How important was it until now? Uh, what is your view on this, your take on that? If you could uh, tell this to our audiences um, who might have not been to Tanzania before. <coughs> We are a fantastic and phenomenal storytelling community for sure. Uh, doesn't matter whether you're waiting for to go, get on the bus or you're um, just uh, walking about and going about your day. But um, in terms of cinema, uh, Amil, I wish you were the one who was answering this question because <laughs> this is. Um, uh, uh, but I, I will, I will, I will, I will do my best. I know that you know for Tanzania, we've had cinema halls there since the colonial era, really, um, and it's it, it's a part of our culture. Um, uh, but that died down um, in the 80s, um, and the form has moved more into TV, which became more ubiquitous. Um, and now, you know, we're the second largest producers of film on the continent, um, and it's mostly viewed uh, by regular Tanzanians, either in what we call these bandas or um, other informal ways of getting films, the DVD format. Um, so we do consume cinema a lot um, as, a, as, as a community. Um, but the question of distribution and space, especially for local content, is always narrow and it's not straightforward. Um, so that builds a certain ad hoc culture uh, of making films, of exhibiting films, um, that uh, requires some nimbleness um, from us all. But we have a strong audience that loves to watch local content. And for East Africa, that is really a feat. Um, uh, but yeah, that's... that's, that's so, and in, in these many, many films that are produced in Tanzania, how many of those are, for instance, period films? Would you recall any films that dealt with a specific period that became very popular? The, we had a very popular actor. His name was um, uh, Kanumba. But I don't know whether anybody here is familiar with uh, Nigerian Nollywood cinema. Um, but that's a form that also is, because it's easy to make, it's easy to produce, um, it's very low budget. Um, and it really, for filmmakers, that's, that's what they do. So in a week, you have your film, it is shot, it is edited, and it is on a DVD, and somebody's taking it out somewhere or screening it to people in a... In, so these bandas are like shacks, and you'll find sometimes that there's like three of them in one small hall, and there's like benches, and everybody's directing their um, eyes to one of these small screens, but they're all like enjoying what it is that they're watching, and they've become... I mean, that's, I think that would be like the largest, most informal setting that we have, Cinemas do exist in Tanzania. We have 11 of them. Um, but it's prohibitive because one of where they're set, which is mostly malls, so a regular Tanzanian does not feel comfortable being in that space. Um, and also a question of cost because it does cost some money for them to be in the cinema space. Um, and the other barrier is that for us as local Uh, uh, filmmakers, getting your film into the cinemas is always a battle um, and one that I have to say my producer is more than uh, formidably done for the few years that we have been working together um, but it does make the connection between local filmmakers um, and exhibition quite difficult so when you're talking about being a filmmaker sustainably How do you do that um, if there's no center for you to say, I'm a producer, it's being distributed, I am getting a return on what's happening? That isn't something um, that for us has become part of the culture yet, but we have been building on it. Luck. So before we talk about Disco Africa, uh, maybe you give us a little bit of an insight. You already said in your introduction that TV is very popular when it comes to uh, consuming um, media in Madagascar. Um, how about the cinema infrastructure? 
give us an overview, like people in Antananarivo, for instance, would they have regular places where they can show, uh, they can watch local content? And what about the rural areas? Is there a network that has something comparable to what CC has described as the informal ways of consuming Madagascar films? Uh, you know, in the the, the 70s, uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, cinema theater in Madagascar, and uh, after they closed. And uh, if you want to uh, to 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 see uh, one another uh, film content, you need to to have a DVD, as you as you said, or uh, exceptionally, there, there is a we call the um, video club. Video club is a personal uh, house who uh, they can show the, the Jackie Chan or uh, uh, Kung Fu films in the little uh, TV, you know. But cinema, cinema was missing in the, the big uh, uh, part of uh, maybe 10 years uh, before. And uh, the Institut Francais only have a cinema theater in Antananarivo. So, uh, in 2006, for example, me and uh, Erzu, my producer, start to, uh, to think about how to make a cinema and to see film in just only a theater in uh, Antananarivo. And actually, we have uh, two or three uh, multiplex in Madagascar and Tananarive locally, but it's just for a blockbuster. So we love cinema. We want to see uh, cinema in the good condition, but uh, not uh, all the people can pay for euro to have a ticket to, uh, for example, to see Oppenheimer or something. And uh, maybe my, my producer, Irsu, can add some things uh, about this. Uh, yeah. We have guests, yeah. <laughs> namely from Madagascar, also the. Sorry. Um, do we have microphones already in the hall? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, in a in a little while, let's uh, let's let's do that in a little while, and maybe before. Um, embarking further on the situation in Madagascar, to which we will come back a little later. Uh, let's come to your film. Okay. Hmm? Disco Africa features in this year's Generation program, so it's a film that my colleagues from Generation have decided, oh, it's directing at a young audience, K plus means uh, 18, 14 to 18 is like the specific target group. Um, this has to do with the fact that the main protagonist uh, himself, who is with us, by the way, also very warm welcome. Uh, his name is Kwame. Um, and Kwame is about 20 years old. The film is set today, shot in black and white. Before we see a clip, I wanted to ask you, Luck, like, what made you choose a young person's perspective on something that happened in the generation of Kwame's father? Yeah. Uh, uh, for me, it was a, a very important uh, big position as a filmmaker to have my first film uh, about this topic because of uh, uh, before... I see the Madagascar was very strong in terms of uh, uh, political positions, in terms of uh, uh, economical situations. And uh, in uh, 20 years ago, after we was a very one of the very poorest uh, uh, country in the world, so I, I just ask myself if I am uh, uh, 20 years old, what is my place in this? Uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, dark situation in Madagascar. It was my first idea to 
to make the, the scenario. And the second idea is, uh, if I, I, I am uh, 20 years old, did I know my history past, uh, my country history past? Uh, and the, when I see the, the people in this uh, age, and when I talk, uh, they don't know. So one another angle is uh, 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 my, my idea is to, to try to, uh, to uh, tell the story uh, that maybe interest this kind of generation in uh, Madagascar. I say the maybe because the film was not uh, showing in Madagascar. Berlin is the second time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's like, uh, yeah. Let's take a look at the clip. I'm just giving a brief uh, moment where, where I, I think it's like 20 minutes into the film. Kwame uh, has been working in the sapphire mines of Madagascar. And uh, there is a big dispute, like who, who do they belong to? That's one of the main conflicts in the film. And over this conflict, he's losing his best friend. And he feels responsible, in a way, for the death of his best friend. And the scene we are going to see is when he's bringing back the body to his native village. And uh, he's meeting, of course, his mother. He stays back at his mother. The scene we are seeing is an encounter with best friend of, or one of the best friends of Kwame's father. So can we please see the second clip?
So I'm trying to find the bridge back to our main topic, cinema and remembrance. And that's why I'm asking you, who also wrote the screenplay for your film, what made you decide to make Kwame's father a musician and not a filmmaker? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm very uh, impressed by uh, music movement in Africa, uh, post-independence. When I wrote this uh, project uh, eight years ago, uh, I was uh, very listening a lot of uh, music from Ghana, from uh, different places uh, of Africa. And uh, in this time, the music was the, the weapon to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, spread the, the revolution in Africa. And when I say the Africa first, it's continent, but Madagascar was contaminated with the same vibes of, uh, of movement and revolutions. Uh, actually, there is a, a very... Uh, a uh, story about the new film of uh, Bob Marley, actually, today. And when you, when you heard about uh, Bob Marley uh, uh, creating the music, uh, for example, Zimbabwe or uh, Africa Unite, at the same time was the war in Mozambique, uh, civil war, and a lot of Malagas people wrote the, the song for Mozambique, uh, revolutionary song for Mozambique. So I think it was in, uh, in the air, the, the music was a good uh, vehicle of uh, revolution. So I decided to, to, to make the father as musicians. And you see uh, Baba in the, the, the film. Baba is one of this kind of musicians. Uh, he's very famous in Madagascar. And uh, it's uh, like an homage uh, that I put behind the films. So, yeah. it, it wasn't meant a provocation. I just wanted you to tell yeah. the story. Mm, yeah. It makes it's perfect sad. sense yeah. in the yeah. film. And in fact, the mm. colleagues from Talents have said, well, you should not cut off the moment. When yeah. Soon after we, we ended the clip, well, uh, yeah. the, you're going to hear the music, and then you completely understand this music is such a great power within your mm. film. So I'm... I hope I don't sound like uh, uh, stupid not getting this. It's really <laughs> wonderful music. I absolutely adore. Uh, however, um, I wanted to ask the three of you the specifics of what can cinema do as a post, not necessarily in competition. So your film is a very good example of that music and film can work hand in hand in you know, creating a certain remembrance. But what is specific about cinema that only cinema can do? And what, you know, novels, literature, theater, all the other arts can't do. So I'm, I'm picking a little bit into getting out the specifics. If you have any ideas uh, to share with us, what do you think makes cinema and remembrance so strong a couple? Can I maybe answer the question um, in regards to documentary film, which I'm, I feel safer with, <laughs> or, or I have more ideas um, to. I think uh, what, and I, I, I find it really difficult to compare, um, because I also think that <clears throat> there are a lot of people who are to whom literature is stronger than to other people. So, you know, it's also a matter of personality and taste and everything. But I think what film can do, and uh, I think especially documentary film can do, is really uh, not only draw you into a story, but create a proximity between people. And that is something that we were hoping to do with our film, that people wherever they are in the world when they watch our film that they feel like they have spent 90 something minutes with John and Cecilia and Felix and Ernest and Maria and Emmanuel and really develop uh, some sort of feeling towards them and an empathy and maybe the beginning of an understanding for, for their situation and I think with this 
you know, these dimensions that film offers. And of course, with working with, you know, everything that, you know, the visuals, the, the, the way that we edit, the music and all of the, the components, um, that is something that we're hoping to create is to really, for, for the audience to be able to, at least for a while, dive into another world and um, in some way bridge some of the gaps that we're having. And right now, there, you know, this world is almost defined by gaps between people. Um, so that's something that, that's, at least for me, I think my main goal with my work is to bring people at least a little bit closer. And I think film is, is very well capable of doing so. <clears throat> uh, when you ask uh, this question, uh, I have in my mind uh, the film of uh, Mohsen Makmal Paf, uh, Salam Cinema, you know? And uh, if I answer this question in terms of uh, Disco Africa, I say the uh, cinema can liberate uh, people, you know, uh, especially in Disco Africa, uh, because uh, actually the, the topic of uh, uh, TV uh, novelas in Madagascar is just about the rich people who have a rich uh, condition and have a rich problem. And that's the first time for Madagascar to see the, the, the people from the, the town to have a journey. To, to, to know what is his story and what he can put something in for, for his country. And I said, uh, I'm expecting to, to, to have this uh, conclusion, the cinema can liberate people. And uh, uh, Disco Africa is, uh, uh, maybe in Chile, he showed Disco Africa in Madagascar and uh, I can ask you the, the result in Chile, but I think it's uh, important to, to, to people to, to, to have this kind of a subject. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, proximity and archiving, um, because uh, at least in our documentary, it was about things that were being kept away, and so people cannot access them. And I feel like cinema, when you were talking about proximity, it brings those things closer and makes those things more accessible. But on the question of archiving, the prayer that you see in the beginning and you hear is actually, um, uh, it's Chingoni, uh, which is a language spoken by the Ngoni people. But Aidan is the only person left who speaks that particular dialect. So... This is gonna live on. This is this is bringing it back for a generation that will have no access to it, and the spaces that we visited also um, were lost to history. Um, but now they're archived, at least for people to revisit whenever they want, and that's the beauty of cinema. You can come back to it, and it is a visual language that is always really easy for anybody to access. It's not prohibitive. Uh, I just want to add one, one another thought. Uh, I think also the, you know, in documentary filmmaking, especially the beauty of the process of filmmaking is also that it's not just the result that can create collective memory and memory as such, cultural memory, but also the act of us as filmmakers being present, because we have heard this a lot, especially with this film, that at the end of the day, I mean, how many days uh, passed where nobody uh, said that this day really helped me because of the, the very intense degree in which our protagonists reflect their situation and share and talk about their family history. So even the process of 
um, or maybe it's a, some, some way of stimulation even, you know, going there, giving them the attention. And it doesn't, it doesn't, it's, um, it's not even the subject in particular, it could be any, I, I've experienced it with other films as well, but to ask certain questions can, is it spawn? Is that the word? Yeah, can spawn like such a, an important process for an entire community. And I think that also, it's not just about the result, but also the act of filmmaking that can do that for a family, a community, an individual. I, that's something that I love a lot. I hope I get the next question across in the right way. So. You have shown us films here at the Berlin, Berlin Film Festival which are done. Three years, eight years, I think it took you to make Disco Africa. Very long process. Very, very heavy subjects. Violence, Sisi mentioned, intergenerational trauma, all these things. So as filmmakers, how, how do you deal with this difficulty that one of the reasons why, for instance, in Tanzania, a lot of this history was kept away and left into communities or even only in families because it was locked away and nobody wanted to talk about. Now you're making a film for a big audience. How do you make the audience wanting to come a film, to see a film in a cinema, in the festival, without them saying, oh, leave me alone, I don't want to deal with that. I don't know, is this question something that was relevant for you? You didn't care? We want to make the film that is, you know, very close to the families and honest. Of course, that is true. But also using cinematographic means that you make want your audiences, international audiences, wanting to see the films you've done. Speechless. <laughs> <laughs> you were talking about liberating. Film has to be liberating. What, for instance, what is, you know, very often a producer would ask, well, what is the feeling you want to leave the audience, the cinema with? How do you create a feeling that you don't say, well, oh, the world is such a horrible place, I'm going to kill myself after having seen the film? What elements did you use to make the stories that you're telling that are very, very difficult, you know, told in a way that we can deal with them so that they become liberating stories. I think in our case, I would say it's all about the balance. Um, the balance of how, you know, when you look at the editing, we have a very, very hard, like hard, heartbreaking interview, and then we need a break. So, <laughs> Um, before we get to the next hard moment, we need some time to breathe. We need some space to process, to digest. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it is in the editing and the pace of the film mm -hmm. and the balance, but of course also the way that we work with the music, trying to um, not only focus on the heaviest moments, but also on the on the lighter moments, on the resilience in the family. Um, so to me, it's, it's a lot about the balance, but I have to say that I think a big part of it is intuition. We did not really talk about, let's use these and these tools to not make this too heavy, but it's, it's a lot about also the way that we felt, I think, during the making of the film. But yeah, I mean, I think it, it, overall, we always knew that the film is challenging also for the audiences and that this is not an easy ride for anybody to watch at, just as it, it wasn't easy to, you know, for the families to talk about, you know, go back in their memory. It wasn't easy for us to make the film, but it's so necessary that you commit yourself to it. And our hope is that audiences will... Uh, you know, watch the film because they feel a necessity to, to face the truth. Um, and then, yeah, of course, there are ways in which we're trying to make the film also in some way appealing without 
it, that, that doesn't mean that we bend to make, to, you know, to please people. But of course, you, and that, that's where the balance comes in, I think, to um, not pull people down and let them down there for 90 minutes. Maybe we can see how luck did it in the very scene from your film. And I don't know if you agree, but sometimes these moments, like when is it that in a family you start talking about the difficult things? Not necessarily only, you know, like political things, but maybe also family history. Very often they pop up in the, not the right moment. And what triggers this moment, you have found a very beautiful way of saying, well, this is how I want to tell it in the case of uh, Kwame and Kwame's family. So can we please see the third clip? Luck. <laughs> when, when I was seeing this scene first, I thought, well, first of all, I really loved the idea of the lights go out. By coincidence, we have a blackout um, to start going back into the past. But maybe you can tell us from your perspective, this scene, I think, is very crucial because from here, the process starts going. How important was it to, to, you know, to put this on stage like an invitation also maybe to some of your audiences to do something similar when they leave the cinema and go home? Uh, the, when I wrote this, uh, this scene, uh, you know, I, uh, I was preparing the three characters to, uh, to a very emotional moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, it was an important to have a, a certain level of emotion. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I start with, uh, you know, music and uh, uh, happy moment, and uh, this uh, 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 the light when the light is uh, off. I think it's one of the moment who. Uh, uh, it, 
if the spectator uh, said, uh, okay, it's a reality, it's a malakas every time the light is off, okay, but uh, we need to ask ourselves, uh, uh, and what next? And uh, I, I think for me, I was trying to have a, a, a different style of narration. You know, it's not like uh, normal, but uh, I have a lot of pause to, to, in terms of narration and the moment. And that's why I'm trying to, to make. Mm -hmm. And when Kwame is back, uh, uh, we don't know what is the next of the, the moment. It is... Uh, uh, the, the continuity of a happy moment, mm -hmm. or uh, we changed, and uh, yeah, but that's the, the process. Uh. In your film, where I thought you have infused a trigger moment that the film actually leaves the cinema and becomes mm -hmm. having a life of its own, is the moment when you go visit the school class in Berlin. And just as a comparison, how you triggered, from, at least for me, how you triggered this off, maybe we can see that scene and then go into debate and maybe you have questions. But before, let's take a look at the scene from the classroom, please. So the fourth clip, please. As you could clearly see, this was not the scene that I was hoping we, would, <laughs> we had selected for this. Also a very, very moving and crucial scene from the film. The scene I was referring to was taking place in a school class, in a Berlin school class, where uh, throughout the process, the two directors with protagonists go inside, confront 
how old are they? 13, 14 year old uh, Berlin school class kids with a scene uh, from partly animated, partly archaeological uh, data that tells about what actually happened then during the Maji Maji um, war. And then the, the kids start apologizing, start saying, well, we didn't know. We should have known. This should be part of our curriculum. Um, I apologize. Why is this not possible for Germans to apologize? So this is a moment which I found was like ideal to have every teacher in Germany who is one day going to see your film on TV saying, well, I want this film to be part of my schooling because there isn't any really, um, you know, it's, it, there is no decent manifestation of German colonial past in our school books, even today. So that's why I wanted to show that clip, but unfortunately it got lost on the way, but maybe one more reason for you to go see the film. Uh, I don't know, did I talk about the scene correctly, or you want to add something with reference to making the combination of cinema and remembrance, leaving the cinema hall and taking up a life mm -hmm. of its own outside? Yeah, I think that's a perfect scene uh, when, you talk, when we talk about um, film and collective memory. Because what it shows is that, um, for example, in Germany, I think a lot of our collective memory that we have uh, dealing with the Holocaust, the Shoah, uh, Second World War, has been created through films and TV series that is... We have the images in our minds and we think we know about that time. It's also very selective. So creating collective memory through film and TV and series, everything, is also an act of, has to do with power. Who gets to decide what we're remembering as a nation, as a society? Because you know, history, there are so many sides, like every historic event has different perspectives, and who gets to make these decisions? What we, for example, as Germans, remember. Um, and when we look at colonialism and film in Germany, there has been a complete denial of the historic truths throughout the decades since then. So what's happening now, it, so that, that's why I think, you know, this whole beautiful opportunity and possibility that film has to create memory is also something that has to be looked at carefully because it has to do with power and decision making and which voices are heard, who gets to make the films, et cetera, et cetera. And I think what's beautiful now is that this younger generation, and we're depicting them in the school class, are starting to make demands. And in Germany, we can observe that very literally, that school classes ask their schools and their teachers, but the headmasters, we don't know enough about German colonialism. It's not part of our curriculum, and it needs to be. And things are beginning to change. So teachers invite guests such as our protagonist Nyaka Sururumboro who now visits school classes very regularly and talks about um, the history of what is now Tanzania and talks about what has happened with the crimes and the ancestral remains for example. So there is a shift but it, ha it, 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 it comes from, from the, the grounds so to say, from the students, from the kids who are asking for times to change. And that is incredible. And this school that we filmed at, it's, it's actually not in um, Berlin, but in Potsdam. Uh, after we filmed there, uh, just a few months ago, the teacher that we were in touch with sent us an email and said, I need to share some news with you. Our 
school, the, the history department, has now implemented for, um, for the, you know, mm, forever, I mean, what's the word for, uh, not just for a moment, but continuously, that ger the, the, you know, German colonial history will be taught so it's not part of the national curriculum, not even the federal state, but this school has changed its history curriculum because the kids demanded that. And it will stay. This will, it, it's not for a year, it's not a project. This is a continuous thing, and it came from the kids. Bravo. Mm -hmm. So you have achieved even before the film is released. That's amazing. Thank you very much. I mean, it's like uh, it shows how powerful uh, even this intervention of you coming to the school, filming there, um, has been when looking at what your film, hopefully in the near future, might do also to many other school classes here and in Tanzania. The floor is open. If you have questions to our guests, um, please make yourself... Yeah. Sorry, I have the microphone now, so i like to add some things. Uh, I take the opportunity. First of all, I'd like to talk about uh, the history of cinema in Madagascar and to add uh, to what, um, what Luke was talking about. In fact, in Madagascar, uh, there is kind of, um, how you say it, um, not a dichotomy, but some, something like a mystery, because we, we were one of the countries in Africa where the cinema and the cinema room existed at the uh, beginning of the 20th century. But unfortunately, with the, policy, with the politics, the socialism politics, socialism, communism politics, it, fall, it fell down in the end of, uh, of the 90s. And uh, all of, uh, of the cinema room closed and, or maybe uh, turned to some um, uh, stores or uh, something, even some, to, to uh, some uh, place where some sects, uh, um, some kind of uh, place churches. where... Churches. Sorry? S churches? Yes, kind of searches, uh, some kind of church, uh, sir, uh, churches, for, excuse me. Uh, so uh, it, uh, cinema really disappeared from uh, Madagascar. And uh, in the early 2000s, the, it re reappeared as a kind of, uh, re, um, how you say it, um, video films, you see. But it was... Uh, much like a radio story turned to a song and uh, pictures. Uh, as uh, Sisi was talking about, it was uh, some kind of films made uh, just uh, in one, one month uh, and um, sold in uh, video, in, uh, sorry, in DVD, for instance. So now cinema in Madagascar are telenovelas, and uh, what we do is not cinema. <laughs> we, we are kind of um, isolated people, and people don't understand. For instance, when we are talking to the government or to the people that we are going to Berlinale, and that our feature film is the first film in our history, to go to a such important festival. Sorry to tell that, but they really don't give a fuck about it. <laughs> because they don't know it. They think that only going to Oscars are great. But uh, when you talk about uh, the importance of uh, having a memory to the government, when you talk about the importance of uh, telling some story that helps people to, um, to, to, to uh, remember things and to have some kind of memory of uh, social history. In fact, 
it's very annoying for them because uh, I don't know if I, I use the, the wrong word, but it's something they really don't. Uh, um, they don't want to to, to, hear, uh, to hear about because it um, it makes them difficult if uh, people begin uh, begin to think about what they are, what are their rights, and what they can do with voting, for instance. So people, as Luke said, people want just to have some. Uh, big cards and something like that. For instance, I will just tell you by example. Uh, a few, now a buzz made in Madagascar is someone who has the first Lamborghini Huracan in, uh, in the roads where you have holes like, uh, I don't know, you can put some trucks in. So. <laughs> It's completely un nonsense. And um, you, sorry, I'm just a little bit long, but uh, uh, Luke was to also talking about uh, how to make people uh, uh, go t to see the film. I think that people are not so, uh, that people are clever. And s most of the time we underestimate the cleverness of the people and we say oh it's good enough for them just give them some some shit they will eat it and in fact i we want to try something different we don't think that we are kings or something like that or very intelligent but we try to tell other stories stories that uh, they can uh, travel they, they can be moved mm -hmm. by, and uh, even our our feature film is uh, completely i don 't remember the word um, not uh, inspired by true events mm -hmm. for the form it 's a mix of all of those stories that happened in, in our country mm -hmm. and uh, just to tell you the difficult we, uh, we had to make this film and to put it in reality. He, Luke said that uh, eight years ago he wrote the, that film. In fact, we met the, the, the producer in 2016, yes. the main producer. Mm -hmm. But we took 13 years of our life mm -hmm. to make it possible from Thank the you. ID. Thank you very, very much for sharing this the story, which is, uh, I, I think sometimes us sitting here comfortably in Berlin, complaining about this and that, we completely have no clue how difficult it is in other countries to, to make a film. And I think Tanzania has a different cinema infrastructure than Madagascar has, but it's not an easy ball game compared to many environments of how films are made, for instance, in Europe or in the Western world. There is somebody else. Thank you. Um, I have a question uh, to you regarding Disco Africa. Uh, the son or the grandson uh, is talking to his uh, grandfather and he says, nothing has changed. Uh, you fought all those fights, but it's still the same. And he says, well, be careful what you say if you can't take it back. Um, and you also said uh, the young people don't know their own um, own story. It's all uh, history now, the stories you told, but I think there are also blind spots. Uh, we don't see what's happening around us today. So um, if you would tell such a moving story uh, in Madagascar about something that happens today, which is uncomfortable for others to hear, uh, what would it be? And uh, for you in Germany, what kind of story would that be? Uh, I'm thinking of Kurt Krömer. He's a German comedian who just thought that it's one year past that the NSU has killed uh, Turkish-German uh, people here on German ground, and nobody's talking about it. Uh, 
I don't know. Do you? Yeah. Well, um, I, I, this was a mix of a comment and that yeah. there are a lot of uncomfortable stories. Maybe you're not fully aware of what the lady was referring to, the NSU. This um, was in fact yesterday that, uh, you know, the, it was the anniversary and the way of how this crime in um, Germany was committed against non-Germans was a horrific landmark crime that really... Mm -hmm. so, sorry? They were Germans but of um, non-German origin. For that reason, they were killed. That was the log sorry of mistaking. So they, they were killed and murdered in the most atrocious way. And in, um, it took um, until now, the reactions or trying to, to analyze what was behind it is a major scandal to many Germans until today and the way of how it is remembered or not remembered. So this is the incidents that she was referring to as one of the German histories that, uh, well, <sighs> has been reported about, but not a film was made about it. So if, uh, y y you know, there are ways of how it is remembered in the cultural scene, but not enough in comparison to others. This is kind of correctly. And you're now asking what would be similar stories for them to, uh, I, 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 sorry, I didn't also didn't, <laughs> okay, so I, I try and, and sum up, maybe you, have you seen the film or not? Okay, so in the film, one layer of the film is not only the remembrance, but also the way of the story relates today very uncomfortable truth that is highly political, also a bit risky, I would think, within the Madagas uh, Madagascan uh, context to tell, that deals with corruption, that deals with who are the people behind Kwame uh, to have killed the, the best friend. Um, that is something that the team took up in the narration, in the storyline, next to bringing up the past. So I feel a bit uncomfortable answering in your behalf because you should say, but I don't know if this answered a little bit your question. No. <laughs> May we continue without you feeling left out? Is, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't get the question across in a better way. I'm sorry for this. So, but we have uh, another maybe last question for this session. When uh, you two came to Germany trying to find out what happened to the skulls and everything, how was the reaction, like uh, in the ministry or also at university? Was it easy to find people to help you or was it difficult? Was there resistance? Was there helpfulness? When we started uh, to work um, on this project, we uh, encountered many people that were very open to talk to us and also um, open to being filmed. Um, but we were so lucky because other people have been working on this for many, many, many years and decades. Um, those people, some of those people are also in our film, some of our protagonists that live um, in, in Berlin and also other German um, cities. So, so they're very, um, what's the word, that they never give up? Mm -hmm. yeah. They never give yeah, well, what's the, yeah, what's the, what's the, you know, their persistence, persistence, their persistence has um, 
opened a lot of doors, doors for us. So uh, Nyaka Sururumboro, I've mentioned him uh, earlier, is uh, a very important activist from Tanzania who has been living here for about 40 years in Germany. And um, he tells us many, many stories of how difficult it has been uh, in recent years to even have conversations about doors to open and then you know, bit by bit, because of this persistence, um, things got easier, and that's when we came in. So they, you know, we were able to actually benefit benefit from a lot of their work. Okay, very last question. As I watch the film, just one persistent question keeps haunting me, and uh, I'm dumbfounded by the resistance, why is uh, skulls being withheld? Why are 250,000 being withheld? It's, it's a simple humanitarian act to give back to families what is rightfully theirs. I, I'm, I'm dumbfounded as to why the reluctance to simply very simply uh, say, I'm sorry, this was an awful act. Uh, the president uh, said he apologized, but w with an apology without returning what is rightfully to the country, it's absolutely meaningless, and it's, it's a slap in the face. And it, 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 it's, uh, it's something that maybe we throughout the film be because it, it, it's just the most outrageous act I've, uh, I think the most outrageous I've ever seen, to have stolen bodies, cut off heads, and not returned what is rightfully to the country and to the family. It's, it's, it's absurd, I just don't understand. Why is it, what, what is the, what is being, what's the re rationale being uh, for, for keeping these, these bodies? It's, it's, it's something satanic about it to tell you, it feels to me, you know? Yeah, uh, I mean, this this particular crime of history is it is absurd um, on very many levels. Um, but it's also become entangled in the institutionalization of this systemic um, problem of racism and colonialism colliding in institutions, right? Um, because Sure, now we are where we are, and thankfully, the language, the discourse, the years and decades of work that has been done by activists um, to highlight this issue is meeting a moment when we're all ready, sort of, um, to at least address this. Now the question as to how the process continues to move forward, because it has been um, ongoing for the last decade at least, um, becomes a question of um, bureaucracy, really. Um, in our film, for example, one of the families, we, the, the, the remains are known. They know the institution, um, they know that their relative is there, they would just like it to be shipped from one country to another. There's a whole myriad of things that need to happen. One, that is a person that you're returning. The, they need a passport. What does that mean? That means that the state has to acknowledge that this person exists. So you go to the museum in the national country that has to now further say, okay, this person has been identified we are now going to be in discussion with this other museum in the United States. Now, unfortunately, because of the bureaucracy that exists, that process has sort of like met uh, diplomatic and bureaucratic loggerhead. So one, that's one of the difficulties, but the other one is that unfortunately, um, the question of how do you identify them? because the way they were stored, um, where they are, not all institutions have released the number of remains that they have. 
there's private collectors. I mean, the, the story and the question is long, um, but just to say, at least the process now is out there and the demands are being made. Um, and, it, and at least, let's not have the perfect be the enemy of the good, you know? At least the process has begun. It's gonna be a difficult one and hopefully because they have already done, uh, New Zealand has a very, very good model um, that um, the rest of the global south is actually hoping to adopt. But New Zealand, and these are indigenous people who say this, they're fortunate in that they are a settler colony. So the government has the money to do that. They spend 500,000 every year on restituting um, indigenous remains back to New Zealand. That's something that African states cannot do. Asia, remember all of the colonies are affected by this. I'm afraid we have to come to an end. Uh, this is, I think, more of an opener to see what all needs to be done. And it's to me to say thank you very much for being courageous enough to, take, to have taken up with your films, with your teams, uh, to bring us to this point, to see lots has to be done. From my side, I wish that with your films, uh, we get a few steps ahead of the many steps that need to be taken. Thank you very much, Cici, Lark, and Agnes. Thank you very much for coming.